I think it was that I could see that he was worth more than that one act, that that was not his essence. And he never claimed to be innocent because he was involved with Eddie, with those kids. And one night, Eddie went haywire, and he had the gun, and he shot and killed him. And I think Pat always felt responsible. I think he, he didn't say, but I do not believe he was guilty of first-degree murder. But believe me, I've learned, and you see in the second book, The Death of Innocence, we got we have a very imperfect, frail, human, flawed system of trying to select even the guilty in this process called the death penalty. So he said, you can't be there because it could scar you. And I'm saying to him, Pat, there's no way you're dying alone. You look at me. You look at my face, and I'll be the face of Christ for you. You look at me. I couldn't bear the thought that he would be killed and he would not see that face to give him dignity. And he agreed. And then we walked to the electric chair. There I was, right behind him, reading to him from Isaiah 43, because I wanted him to know his dignity as a human being. I have called you by your name, you are mine. If you go through the sea, you will not drown. If you go through fire, you will not be burned. And then I look up, and there's the execution chamber. The witnesses are all assembled in plastic chairs. There's a plexiglass to protect them from the smell of a human body being burned as it's electrocuted. The, there's an exhaust fan turned on that's already sucking the air out of the room. A big clock on the wall that shows that we're p two minutes past midnight. And I went and sat with the witnesses. They strapped him in the chair. He looks in the witnesses. And if you see the film, you see Susan Sarandon doing this. And I did that so he, he could see where I was, and he looked at my face. Then they put a mask over his face to protect the witnesses from seeing him when 1,900 volts of electricity, what, what happens to the human face. That's to protect the witnesses, protect them from seeing it. We are still trying to protect witnesses. The three drugs that are injected, the second one, pain curonium bromide is solely to paralyze them so that the witnesses, the very few witnesses, do not see them twisting and jerking on the gurney when they're thrown into cardiac arrest. Do we want to see what we do or don't we? We don't even want the witnesses to see any kind of struggle like we're killing somebody here. In Utah, you were pretty honest. You said, we're going to shoot you through the heart and you're going to be dead. We got the death penalty here, man. But lethal injection, they even put alcohol on people's arms before they inject them. You got a germ-free death. <laughs> How antiseptic can we get? And then you got a few witnesses, few witnesses. And we never going to make it public. Are you kidding me? Why don't we make it public? They say, well, we don't want people to get callous about death. Right. I'm brought into this. I watch Patrick Sonia executed. I walk out, it's the middle of the night, I throw up, I never see anybody killed in front of my eyes. And believe me, it didn't matter one bit that the Supreme Court said it was fine, it was according to the Constitution. Didn't matter one bit that 80% of Louisiana in 1984 thought the death penalty was a fine idea. I had seen it. I threw up and I said, I'm a witness. They're never going to see this. You're never going to be brought close. I got to tell the story. And I started in 1984. And believe me, we didn't have a book. We didn't have no Susan Sarandon in a film. And I'm giving talks to whoever will hear me. Captive audiences like sociology at Loyola University. Dennis Caleb's class, they had to listen to the nun. Oh, here comes that nun, man. She's going to be talking on the death penalty. If you Google me today and you put in death penalty nun, that's me. I never dreamed when I became a nun I was going to be the death penalty nun. That's not exactly something you seek. <laughs> Anybody who listens, St. Christopher's Nursing Home after lunch, announcement, who wants to hear the death penalty nun? Three people. Three people right after lunch. I'm talking. Ten minutes to them are gone. <laughs> One lady listening. And I had my eyes locked with that lady like, don't leave me, lady. You're it. And then Goethe said something. He said that when we're committed to a cause, and it's noble, and it's worthy, and we're unswerving, providence moves for us, and resources make their way to us. So here I am, giving talks to whoever will listen. And one day the phone rings, and it's Susan Sarandon. This is after I've written a book.
And she was filming the client in Memphis, and she had to come to New Orleans for a couple of days of filming. She was reading Dead Man Walking, and she said, I'd love to meet you. So I go, I rent Thelma we see what she looks like. <laughs> I know that's really pitiful, but I had heard about it through Amnesty International that, that Susan Saran is very principled and strong about human rights. So meet her, we talk, took her nine months on Tim Robbins' case before he broke down and read the nun's book. I mean, she'd say, did you read the book? No, I did not read the book. He had other projects going on, say, but she's on it. Susan's on it. And one night, they're walking along the street of New York. She takes him by the arm, and she, she breaks into tears. And she said, Tim, if we're not going to do that movie, then we need to turn it over to somebody who will. Because she understood that we needed to get away to get the American people into the deeper part of this journey to reflect on this, because you're never going to see it. How are we going to do that? And she saw that my book, which will take you over to the victim's family and also over to the one executed, would be the way. So finally, Tim goes, OK, Susan, I'll read the book. And the film then was made. Against all odds, you have to understand the Hollywood studios, every one of them turned down the film. They don't think this is going to be a box office success. And they're saying to Tim, Tim, it's a downer, Tim. You got dead in the title for starts. <laughs> and the guy's guilty, and he's going to be executed at the end. And you got a nun with the death row inmate. We got no romantic element. So if you let us spice it up between maybe the nun and the death row inmate, maybe we'll have a story. Tim Robbins is saying to them, it's not about spicing it up between a nun and a death row inmate. We got a story, and it's to bring the American people into the deeper recesses of their own hearts here and the search for redemption. It's not just about the redemption of the one to be executed. It's about our redemption, too. Because as long as we as a society say, it's OK, I'm for it. And if we have never stood up, if we have never signed anything, that we've never indicated where we are on this issue. It means that we support it, because we're a democracy, and if we're not standing up to change it, it means we're complicit with it. If we're silent, we're complicit. If we're working to change it, and I know it's going to take more than one talk from one nun or one book or whatever, because some people, it's really a tough struggle for us. Some people can hear it and go, mm, I got it, and they know where they are. And I understand if it's a struggle for you. And you say, well, I'm on the fence about this thing. Man, I mean, there's some terrible crimes, especially if anybody in their family has anybody who's a policeman. They see the worst. The policemen see it all. Dead man walking, death of innocence. I have continued to accompany people on death row, and I have accompanied six people to execution. And my second book is about two people I accompanied to execution. And I'll take you through that in the book. You know the good thing about reading the book? is it's just you, your imagination, your intelligence, what you know, but you trust a storyteller to take you through a journey you know you otherwise are not going to have. And Dobie Williams' story, it's going to break your heart. He was an African-American man with an IQ of 65. Louisiana killed him in 1999. And you're going to hear everything that happened when he went to trial. You're going to hear about how terrible the lawyer was who had no testing of the forensic evidence done. And you're going to have to go through the execution. Because, and when your own imagination is involved, it's very intimate. Because you're going to be going through Dobie in the death house telling his mama goodbye. You're going to go through it with him three times, because first two times he gets an hour away from death, and he gets a stay of execution, goes back, brought back one month later to die, tells his family goodbye. And again, right at the brink of dying, trying to summon his, his courage to walk, another stay of execution. If you read about somebody who kidnapped somebody and put him in a cabin and said, we're going to kill you in one week, count your days, take them out Friday night, 10 o'clock, when they said they're going to do it, they blindfolded, their hands are tied, they feel the gun against their temple, and they hear click. Nah, not tonight. You know you're reading about torture. You can recognize it. Oh, that's torture. When the state gives someone a date and moves them into the death house, or even when they don't, 
and they give them a date, they have, they're conscious and they have imagination and everybody on death row has the same nightmare. And poor devil be three times. When they came the third time, he said, Sister Helen, I just needed to be over. He had an IQ of 65. The Atkins decision of the Supreme Court would have saved his life. Finally, the Supreme Court, after how many years, says, uh, maybe we shouldn't kill many retarded people. The whole world knew we shouldn't be killing mentally retarded people. It took our Supreme Court to, to, for, till 2001 to make a decision. No, you can't kill mentally retarded people. And then after that, no, you can't kill kids. When I wrote Death of Innocence, if you were 18, you couldn't be, buy alcohol, you couldn't buy cigarettes, you couldn't sign a legal contract, you couldn't join the army, and you couldn't witness an execution, but you could be executed in the United States of America. What's happening? What, who, who are we? What is going on? And all these tortured discussions you hear now? Well, we need to adjust the Geneva Conventions. We need to have an alternative way we can, like, interrogate people. It's all part of the same thing. Second person in the book is Joseph Adele, a man in Virginia. Same kind of story. You know who I begin to really have compassion for? The jurors. Because, you know, they're just people like us. Take you 12 right here. Go behind those closed doors. We're going to present stuff to you now. There's been a terrible murder. And you're going to get to play God for a little while, and you're going to decide if your fellow citizen lives or dies. Joseph Odell was a man in Virginia accused of killing this woman, Helen Shartner. Had the mistake of being in a bar, the same bar that she was in that night, and she was killed afterwards, and they went after him. The prosecution went after him, and they got him. He defended himself, didn't even know how to summon witnesses, didn't even know how to file motions, and the Supreme Court of the United States did not find that that was ineffectiveness of counsel, said he chose to do it. Of course, he chose to do it when he found out the one who had been appointed to defend him was telling the prosecution everything they were planning. So he said, I would rather defend myself. And the juror now who's listening to this and the evidence that they're presenting and the eyewitnesses and all this kind of stuff, you know, you have competing scenarios at a trial. Prosecution presents, here's the story, here's how it goes, here's how it matches now the forensic evidence. Defense presents, hopefully, has independent forensic testing done and then presents a scenario with eyewitnesses, and you have two competing scenarios of what happened. One of the defense attorneys in Louisiana said the most dangerous, vulnerable ones at a capital trial are people who are innocent because they say, I know the truth, and it's just a question of time. Once people hear it, they're going to know I'm innocent, and they're more vulnerable than people who are guilty. And part of what happened to Joseph Odell was suddenly surprise witness Steve Watson is sprung, and here he comes to the stand, and he had been in a cell with Joseph Odell. We have what's called a jailhouse informer. Some people, in a derogatory way, call it a jailhouse snitch. Utter surprise to Joseph. Here's Steve Watson, who gets on the stand, and he says, Joe confessed to me that he killed this woman, Helen Sharton. We were talking in the cell, and he told me that he killed her. And that was all the jury needed, because everything was circumstantial. It, the confession did it, put the nail in Joe's coffin. It took me four years to write Death of Innocence, and I think one of the reasons it took me so long was I had to wait till that phone call and that email came from Steve Watson, who said, what am I going to do? I lied. They killed Joe. I've retired. I got a bad heart, and I keep seeing his face. He keeps coming in my living room. What do I do? The jury had no way of knowing he was lying. When they asked, did you get a deal for this, Mr. Watson? No, indeed, no, I got no deal with the prosecutor. I, I got no deal. Later, though, after, shortly after the confession, he's released. How do people know what the truth is? Trials are supposed to be the place, an adversarial system of telling the truth. But if you don't have defense and you got just prosecution with all the resources, that's why in the South, in Louisiana, our public defenders... They get their salaries from traffic tickets. 
Can you imagine the state we're in in New Orleans with the public defenders? The traffic tickets have pretty well dried up because we got no traffic. <laughs> Only half of the city is returned. Look how the abysmal system of paying public defenders to defend people's lives, but we don't have a way of getting to truth. And if we're going to do the godlike thing of saying we're going to decide when people live or die, when they're ready to go meet their maker, don't you think we better have a little bit of God's wisdom in the process of deciding how we do it? And I believe, I feel bad for you, for jurors. The people who were the jurors of Joseph Odell, they didn't know. If they read Death of Innocence and they read Joseph Odell's story for the first time, they're getting all the information that was withheld from them during trial. Politics enters into it. And just egos in, I mean, prosecutors getting in there and they want to win. And then in the South, in Louisiana, they give each other these little behind the scenes pat on the back awards when they get death penalties. Like, add a way to go, man. You got one, huh? And they give each other these little plaques. It shows a Louisiana state bird flying and you look in its talons and it has a hypodermic needle. Got a death penalty. Lethal injection. A friend of mine, a defense lawyer, asked, he had a friend, he said, you got any of the plaques? They call them the Louisiana Prick Awards. Yeah. We got to say this for the camera, it means hypodermic prick. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they run for office, they brag about how many, uh, how many death sentences they got. Is this equal justice is carved into the marble above the Supreme Court? Who's on death row? Well, look in Louisiana. Look in the 10 southern states where over 80% of the actual executions go on. 1% of executions happened in the Northeast. Everybody's got the same constitution. Everybody's got the same guidelines from the Supreme Court when they put the death penalty back in 76. We're not going to have it arbitrary and capricious anymore. Who's on death row? Who's the profile? They're all poor, virtually all poor. Rich people don't go to death row, and we know why. Because they get good defense who knows how to work the law for them. It isn't just having constitutional rights. You've got to be able to access them. Who else? Overwhelmingly, people who killed white people. White people. When people of color are killed, I learned this in New Orleans, over 90% of people killed in New Orleans were black on black crime victims. And how many times did the DA pursue the death penalty if it was a black person killing another black person? And nobody's surprised. In a police notebook, they had N-O-N. That's a little code word, just nigger on nigger. We're not going to go for any ultimate punishment if a nigger kills another nigger. Or in the West, a Native American kid killed or a Mexican-American kill kid, or, or an immigration person killed. And yet the Supreme Court has said, now here's your criteria. Now you only go for the worst of the worst murders. And don't give the death penalty for ordinary murders. Anybody in here know what an ordinary murder is? Well, my mother was killed, but you know it was an ordinary murder. She wasn't, she wasn't in a little pizza place where they put her in a deep freeze and killed her with 1,200 people. Just my mama, you know, but to kill my mama. Or, and you ever witness when those, here you have the state legislatures that have got to draw up their statute now, or how they going to get the worst of the worst in Utah? And they start making their list. Well, if you kill a policeman. And then they say, well, if you kill a child, oh my God, what's worse than that? Or if you kill more than one person. And then they throw a bushel full of adjectives if it's cruel, atrocious, heinous. Who knows what that means? Anybody killing a human being who's innocent, it's all of those things. Because the person cannot be replaced. We don't have a way to design it. Who now, well, whose death isn't worthy of the death penalty? What does ordinary murder mean? And you listen to the hearings, these parents come and say, look, our child was killed, but he doesn't fit the definition of child, which has got to be 12 or younger. He happened to be 14 years old. Are you going to say our child's not worth the death penalty because he wasn't 12 or younger? He was the light of our lives and we lost him. Why don't we have the death penalty for him? Or a woman says, my husband was a firefighter and he was going up the ladder to save somebody in the burning building and a sniper killed him. He's not a policeman. We don't have the death penalty for firefighters? And just start your list. Where do you draw the line? How do we do this? 
And it ends up the track record, the actual track record, of what's the worst of the worst for starters, did you kill a white person or did you kill somebody of another race that we don't care about as much? I just want to say we're human beings and we don't have a way to do this thing. And because we don't have a way of getting truth coming out of the trial, we can't even get just the guilty. Innocent people are going in along with the guilty. If you're poor, you had poor defense, did the truth come out your trial? Who knows? The jury does their best. They listen to what's presented. They do their best. But they don't know. How do you interpret all that forensic evidence? How do you, how do, how do you know about the eyewitnesses that have been kept that, that you're not hearing? You don't know. You don't know what's withheld from you. And so, friends, it's not, we want to think about it. It's all about discourse. It's all about reflecting. It's all about, hmm, let me see. Let me see where I am on this. And the good thing, too, about a book is you can go into it and you don't have to argue with anybody. Maybe your whole life you've been sitting on the fence of this. Maybe your whole life you're saying, yeah, got to have the death penalty. And when you're reading a book, you can get new information. You can look at it. You don't have to argue with anybody. And you might just change your mind. Or you might not. One kid it was in a senior class in Cincinnati. They went to see Dead Man Walking. And he said, before I went to see the film, I believed in the death penalty. After I went to see the, the film, I believed in the death penalty more. He got what he deserved. And it just takes you there. The film takes you there. And the book gives you information more. And I take you with me and what I'm learning about this. I just want to say I've been to England, I've been to Europe, I've been to Japan, I've been all over the place. I want, the American people are not any more vengeful than people in England and all these countries now, the majority countries that don't have the death penalty. We just have never been presented with it or brought up close so that we can look at it and study it and reflect on it. Death penalty doesn't touch most people personally. When was the last time at your Thanksgiving day you said, now family, let's talk about the death penalty? You know, because it doesn't touch us. Well, it touches me and I can't, I've been the witness and so I'm telling the story. The books that we'll have outside, you can get Dead Man Walking and Death of Innocence for $25. If you only got 20, look me in the eye and talk to me. <laughs> I hope if you've never in your life affixed your signature to a document where you personalize and take a stand, and notice what it is, it's to call for a moratorium. This is part of a worldwide campaign. What you're saying is, can we stop killing people, can we stop the executions so that we can take a hard look at this issue and realign ourselves if we need to so that we don't do this anymore. Uh, be there to sign books as long as you want to be there. And oh, I also want to say that Tim Robbins has written a stage play of Dead Man Walking. And the State, the theater piece is designed just like the film to bring you over to both sides. And it's all to get people thinking and to have theater as an integral part of the educational process. And I'll have flyers about the, uh, the stage play of Dead Man Walking. And I hope that, that some of you will be interested. Talk to your professors. There are two departments that have to be willing to pick up the issue of the death penalty, to study it, debate it. And, and then do the stage play here at the school. And uh, so I want to have that invitation too. Um, Bill, do we have time for questions or anything? Or did we blow the time or? We do. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. OK, uh, let's take some time now for just conversation or questions. Uh, We also, if any of y'all have rich aunts, we have books for $100 that was signed by Susan Saran and Tim Robbins and me. And it helps the moratorium campaign. It's a little fundraiser thing. Okay, you're on. Hi. Hey. Um, I don't really know your name, but I know you're a nun. And I, I don't like, know yours either, and I know you're not a nun. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to agree with you that I think we do need to make these um, executions public, because I have never seen an execution myself. I would like to see one. In, 
I do agree with you. That's the only way that it's really going to change our, our minds and all that. Yeah. And just one person is not, not really going to make a difference. So I do agree with you on that. Uh, yeah, I suggest that you start writing to your legislatures and say, look, if we're serious about this thing, let's start making them public. Because if it's to deter crime, if that's a reason, surely that ought to do it, right? Mm -hmm. I suggest you do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, somebody else. I just wanted to say, I noticed a little bit of attrition here in the room, and just want a reminder to everybody that there's a book signing and a reception with Sister Helen in the 206 rooms, which are just outside the theater and to the left. Thank you. Just, I, I was hearing something just recently, and I believe it's in the city of Philadelphia, where uh, um, the uh, judicial system are looking now for the uh, young children ranging from ages of about 10 on, and it turns out that they're predictors of violent crimes, especially of <laughs> homicide. So what they are doing is looking for these young people that have the predictors, and then their ca the caseload of an average um, parole officer in Philly is about 60 persons. They now look at the predictors, and if, if the young people fall into this category, which turns out to be uh, especially uh, depression, violent crimes at a young age, and so forth, they get special treatment. That is, they get put with a, with a parole officer with only 15 of these kids, and so far the early indications are they are preventing homicide. Yeah. It seems to me we ought to be putting Absolutely. more of our efforts Absolutely. into that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, Mike, this is right. Up. He's our resident sociologist. He knows this stuff. Over 90%, is this true? Over 90% of people on death row were abused as kids. Is that? Or fetal alcohol syndrome. Over 90%. So can we figure this out? You pump, a friend of mine said, you pump violence into a kid or, or fetal alcohol syndrome, their brain isn't wired right, we can begin to predict and that intervention. This is being done in Philadelphia. Doesn't that make sense? Let's prevent the violence before it happens instead of in this very selective way picking certain people, say, yeah, you're the worst of the worst and then killing them. Somebody else? Maybe one more and then we'll go out and I can see you at the reception and everything because I do want to get to sign the books. Yes, sir. This hits a little close to home. I had a grandson murdered in um, 2001. Uh, he was viciously beat to death, oh, so wow. bad that it split his liver in half. Um, the perpetrator was caught, um, arrested, and we attended the trial. We were asked as a family if we would support the death penalty. Um, I've always believed in the death penalty, but I had a little mixed emotions because it hit right at home. Yeah. And we elected to um, ask for life without possibility of parole. Uh, so, and there was mixed emotions about that. Yes, but um, the kid that did it, um, he never will admit it, um, but it's a real close to home situation because he was abused as a child. Um, so I'm not sure he de deserved the death penalty, but I, I hope that Took he will that remember home. every day of his life what yeah. he did to our grandson. My son is now in prison because uh, he was self-administering drugs uh, with methamphetamines to get over the emotional oh. stress because oh. there was no support, oh. uh, right. no way to help the victim. My wife for three years was just a miserable person to be around because she had taken care of our grandson for a long time. Oh, that's so So it's really, it's a tough situation. Um, most people in the room probably have never experienced a situation where they had to be asked, will you support the death penalty? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a real hard challenge. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Okay, I'll okay. see you over at the books. Thank you, it's been thank great you. to be with you.